Hello everyone, welcome to part four, the final part of my video series on my 30 pound featherweight combat robot crippling depression. This video is all about the weapon system. In part one of this video series, I already talked about how both the weapon system and the drive system are essentially modular. And if you remember back from one of the previous videos, you can see this is the drive module, and then here is the weapon module. You might have seen this in a previous video that I did. I did a from start to part on this piece right here that I machined out of aluminum on my Tormox CNC machine. And then in the assembly video for crippling depression, I did the full assembly of this. And in the assembly video, I did talk about some of the specs and you know some of the features of this and of course I show the assembly of it with all the bearings and spacers and things like that. I'm not really going to double up that information and go into more detail on the assembly of it. What I did want to cover in this video is a little bit more of the data, the numbers. I want to talk about the specs, the materials used, and all the um, kind of data that goes behind the design for this. So to give you a little bit of an overview of this weapon block, at the bottom we have this disc of S7 tool steel. It's about 10 inches, 10 and a quarter inches if you account for like the tooth and everything at the widest part. And um, this is a half inch thick. This weighs about seven pounds. This was water jet cut and then it was hardened after that. Um, I think 56 Rockwell C was the hardness on this. And the aluminum block up here is a piece of 6061. This was all machined from a solid piece on my Tormox CNC. I have a whole video that goes into that. And this whole assembly as it stands right here is 12 pounds. So this is actually 40% of the entire weight of the robot. So there's actually a lot of weight up here. The two motors here are prop drive V2. These are 580 kV motors and they're about 2000 watts, somewhere around there. As you saw in the electronics video, hopefully you watched the electronics video, they have a 190 amp, 200 amp peak ESC on each of them. The motors themselves should really only peak about 100 amp, but the 200 amp ESC is just there for a little bit extra buffer. So that means at 580 kV, kV is always the kV times the voltage, so I'm running this on a six cell battery, which is 24 volts. That means my final RPM is about 14,000 RPM. RPM at the motor and then in the belt drive system down below inside of there it is a 2.25 to 1 gear ratio which gets me a final RPM on the actual weapon of about 6200 RPM which means that the tip speed the speed that the actual tip of the weapon is traveling is about 184 miles an hour. So now we've talked about the RPM, the motors, tip speed, and all that good stuff. Let's talk a little bit more about the weapon disc design specifically. So there's a couple different reasons why it is a round disc with the one offset tooth. Um, I'm not going to really go into that much detail about the theory of weapon design and things like that because I don't know that much about it, but I wanted to go with a single tooth and 6,000 RPM and 185 miles an hour is kind of the tip speed that I wanted. And it's basically all about engagement. If you have a ton of little teeth around here and it's moving really fast, you're really never going to engage unless you're going really slowly. But if you have a single tooth, you have a much better chance of actually engaging. So that's why I went with the single tooth design. If you look really closely, you might notice that it's uh, kind of like offset and oblong. And I mentioned this in the overview video. Uh, basically what I did is I started with a round object in SolidWorks and then I did a scallop on it, you know, basically an arc to create a tip section on it. And then I did another curve on the other side to basically cut into it. So it's almost kind of like a nautilus shell to where one side comes out and one side kind of comes in and that's what forms the actual tooth. Once you have that profile done, you can do a center of mass calculation and then assign a point or reference point to that, if you will. And then that becomes your center hole and then all other features basically cascade from that. If you do that, you can guarantee that that center of gravity will be right in the middle and you won't have any wobble or things like that. And I got really lucky. I used a good water jet cutter that was able to cut this to relatively tight tolerances and I had no issues with balancing this weapon. I basically 
put it on a rod with some bearings, spun it around for like three hours and just put a note every time where it landed to see if it would land on a heavy spot. So let's say that the tip was heavier than normal. If you spin it around and the tip always lands at the bottom, then your tip is probably heavier and you're gonna to need to take off some weights there. Um, you can also do a couple other things where you can kind of put a magnet on either side and see if that actually ends up you know, ending up at the bottom to see if that extra added weight influenced it. I did a lot of the little different tips and tricks and I found that this was relatively balanced and then I brought it into the backyard away from everything else and spun it up to see if it was actually balanced. So that actually wasn't too bad. So now let's talk about the next topic that's very difficult to kind of gloss over, but I'll try my best. The topic of moment of inertia. Moment of inertia is basically a um, calculation that you can do that figures out where the weight is situated and essentially how much torque it takes. So let's say you have a 10 pound weight, but it's very long and very skinny and you're rotating it you know, around the center axis. It's not gonna take much torque for this really long skinny thing, but let's say you have this very flat and very big, it's gonna take a lot more torque. The more weight that's distributed further out, the more torque it essentially takes to start moving. So with a weapon disc like this, having the weight further and further out, as you can see I have these cutouts in the middle, I wanted to move as much of the weight to the outside as possible. That does um, basically one thing, is it stores more energy because the weight is stored more towards the outside versus the inside, so it affects the startup spin. It's gonna take more power to actually get it spinning up to speed, but you're actually storing more energy in this weapon in the forms of you know, kinetic energy. So in terms of calculations, my moment of inertia for this weapon is 0.028 kilograms per meter squared. And if you're using any kind of um, CAD program like SOLIDWORKS or Fusion 360, you can just click a button, get your moment of inertia and figure out what that is. And then using that number, you can then calculate the amount of torque that's gonna be needed to spin this up. And there's a lot of calculators online. I'll try and link to some down in the description where you can then calculate your spin up time. And then also with your motors and with everything else that you're choosing, you can kind of figure out you know, how long it's gonna to take to spin up, if it will ever spin up, and how much current you might need for that. With mine, I calculated a total spin up time of about two and a half to three seconds. And I did have some belt slipping, which I actually accounted for, um, but I wanted that belt slip. And so I would say it's probably closer to about five seconds, but within that first second, it's actually really good. And in doing the initial testing, if I just punch it forward on the throttle, I will get some belt squeal and some belt slip. But generally speaking, if I feather it up, I can go up pretty quickly and not have an issue with that. The last thing to mention is the stored kinetic energy. If you get up into the high powered spinners, all the vertical and horizontal spinners and stuff like that, everyone's always talking about KV. You know, what's your KV rating? And KV or KE, sorry, KE is your kinetic energy. How much stored kinetic energy do you have in your disk? For this, in theory, it's 5,800 joules. So that's about how much energy is stored in this weapon. If I had gone to a different weapon profile, a different weapon design, that all changes. But based on the moment of inertia of 0.028 kilograms per meter squared and a RPM of 6,200 RPM, I have a stored kinetic energy of 5,876 joules. So hopefully that gives you kind of at least an introduction into how to calculate the physics behind these spinning weapons. It took me quite a while to end up with this design for the weapon block. I knew I wanted to do an undercutter, but there's a lot of different ways to do it. One of the things that I knew is I wanted the weapon to be completely free on the underside. I didn't want anything else to be on the underside. I wanted it to ride directly on the ground so I could get it down as low as possible. And that's kind of where I came up with the idea of doing the two tapered roller bearings. This is very similar how you would do a um, lead screw in a CNC machine. I kind of copied that design from preloading two rolled taper bearings in together. Now, the tricky thing about this design and the reason why it is so hard is, so if we look at the wheel, this wheel is the Bainbot's uh, three and seven eighths inch wheel. So it's 3.875 inches. From the bottom of this weapon to the very top of the motor is 
five inches. So if we stack these up side by side, you can see that the wheel is almost the same height as this. There's only about 0.33 or 0.35 inches left. The robot is invertible. Crippling depression can drive right side up or upside down. So that means with that extra 0.35 inches, I have, I think, um, about an eighth of an inch on the bottom and 0.1875 on top for clearance for drive. And in addition, I also have the armor that goes on top, other things. So it was a very difficult challenge to be able to space everything out, try have a half inch weapon, a half inch belt, you know, the pulleys are in here, there's enough meat in this to where I can actually bolt on the motors, and I have a two inch motor on top of that. So being able to fit everything in this tight little compact package was really difficult. Now, I could have gone with a right angle setup, but the reason I didn't go with a, you know, motor with a miter gear and then the weapon down here was because I wanted to go with a belt setup. And there was really no good way that I could do a belt drive with a right angle gear. And the reason I didn't want to go with a gear is because you have this weapon that's spinning around really fast and it comes into contact with something, it's going to want to stop or you know push the other thing away and you're transmitting a lot of energy back and forth. And with a belt, it can just slip, no problem. However, with gears, you're going to shear a gear off, you're going to transfer that energy back into the motors, you could potentially break a motor shaft, things like that. So I really knew that I wanted to have the um, flexibility of having a belt in here and I'm actually using these serpentine belts I'll get into that a little bit more later and I even have this belt tensioning mechanism up front so I can actually kind of adjust the amount of tension that I have I actually kept it at the lowest setting um, but I might actually ratchet it in a little bit and it basically just moves these two um, bearing clusters in to add more tension onto the belt but that is why this was so much of a challenge is there just isn't that much vertical height to deal with. So that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about with the current version of the weapon assembly for Crippling Depression. Going forward, I'm probably going to make a few little changes. There's always little iterations and changes to be made. I got a lot of criticism initially for the size of the weapon tooth. Yes, people on the internet criticized me for the size of my weapon tooth. I used a relatively small weapon tooth because I didn't really need to take a big hit or a big chunk out of people. I just kind of wanted to you know, scare them a little bit and keep hitting them repeatedly. However, for the next version of this, I am going to do two different weapon sizes. I'm going to do a slightly bigger one and then a really big one. The really big one will be used mostly for softer targets like aluminum or plastic, things like that. And then the more medium size will be used primarily for you know, the most of the battles. And I'm still going to keep this weapon and keep this design. They'll be all interchangeable. This one will be used for people that decide to do silly things like having a solid S7 tool steel chassis. Pop-Tart, thanks a lot. So I still keep this weapon, do two more. Um, the motors performed well. I ended up blowing one of the motors in the very last rumble. I was pushing it way too hard, hitting into the arena over and over and over and over just to see what would break. Well, one of my weapon motors broke, so that's a problem. But I think overall the weapon motors were fine. Spin-up time was good. Um, the bearing assembly is still absolutely solid. There is no play whatsoever in this bearing assembly. It's still very smooth. I'm not going to make any changes there. Um, the pulleys were good. That's fine. I'm gonna need to figure out a different way of mounting this in the frame. The frame held up just fine. However, um, I get a better shot of this. These are all the screws that mount along here into the frame, and they are just all crooked and cockeyed. Uh, these all just got bent up bad. So what I'm probably going to do is, I've got the three mounting points, I'm probably going to do some kind of key here, like a dowel pin or something like that, that actually keys it into the frame, so less of the stress of the impact is going directly into the bolt. Um, the last thing that I want to mention is the whole washer assembly up here. So as I said before, there's basically a 3 8 inch bolt that goes through here, through here, and that compresses the whole stack. The bolt is not there to hold the weapon in place, it's there to hold the bearings in place essentially. And so I have all these washers up top, and in the very first fight, I noticed that the weapon was loose, and I got all scared about it, and it turned out that the washer had actually just cupped in. So many hits against that weapon, it just cupped down like that, and so I ended up adding two washers, 
two washers cupped. I ended up adding three washers, three washers cupped. So what I'm gonna do for the next version is I'm gonna get rid of these actual nuts and washers, and I'm just gonna make a big old hub out of titanium, and it's gonna be basically a piece of titanium that screws into there. So it's gonna be like a half inch thick washer. That should solve the issues. But other than that, everything performed as I would want it to. And um, overall, in general, I was very happy with the performance of Crippling Depression as it was the very first featherweight robot I've ever built and the first combat robot I built over three pounds. So hopefully with all the assembly videos, all the part making videos, and then this four part series, it gives you a much better idea of how to make a combat robot and some of the ideas behind it. So thanks as always for watching and I'll see you next time.